So I'll, I'll, um, I'll go, go right into what I'm doing right now. And I think as I go along, I'll probably, you know, touch on how I got here. As Joan mentioned, I uh, did my PhD research on insect metamorphosis. The, the thread that runs through everything that I do is my fascination with metamorphosis, with this uh, transformation. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I, I've got some um, time in the middle of the uh, presentation where we can talk about what metamorphosis is. A lot of you probably um, have ideas about it and um, scientists have ideas about it, but there's a lot of uh, uh, different concepts out there. And so, and it, and, it, and it is a fundamental way of framing what I think about. So, but what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is uh, our efforts at Friday Harbor Labs to attempt to raise an endangered sea star, uh, the sunflower star Pycnopodia helianthoides. And uh, the people who are listed here on the front are my lab assistants and other people who've helped out over the couple of years of this project that started in April, 2019. Uh, it really got going in early 2020, right when the pandemic hit. And we have been, you know, dealing with trying to keep this all going. And these people have been instrumental in making that happen. Uh, so. So this is, um, these are some sunflower stars and these are actually three of the sunflower stars in our uh, care. Um, this is uh, three of the ones in our colony. We have actually 26 sunflower stars in our colony. And for almost all of them now, we know male and female. And one of the things that I think you will immediately see if you didn't already know this about sunflower stars is their brilliant coloration and the variation in their colors. So you can see that these three stars, I'll bet like if I mixed them up and showed them to you again, you could tell those three apart. Well, as it turns out, we can tell all 26 of our sea stars apart. And uh, some of them aren't quite, I, I picked this, particular picture because these are three that are quite different looking from each other. So some look fairly similar, but if you look really, really carefully at some of the details, um, such as these brown spines here, or the striping patterns that run down their arm, for example, uh, you can um, distinguish one star from another. And so we know every single one of our stars and we have them named. Um, this, for example, is Olga over here. So uh, to tell you a few more things about sunflower stars before getting to that, they're, um, I believe many of you are probably familiar with them. They're, they're iconic west coast of North America sea stars. And some of the things that they're most famous for are first of all, they are the largest sea star in the world. They can get to the size of a giant trash can lid. Uh, and um, they are also quite mobile. Uh, they, unlike most sea stars that you might encounter in the inner tidal, um, if you're beachcombing, kind of sitting there not doing a whole lot, um, when the tide goes out with these stars, they will zip around quite a bit. They're, they're one of the um, mo most mobile species. So they have probably fairly significant home ranges and they are very vicious predators. These, these uh, sunflower stars, uh, you know, I mean, it's really totally appropriate to think of them as a predator at the level of something like a shark. Um, they strike fear into their prey and they eat a very wide variety of, um, of uh, organisms on the seafloor. And uh, you know, they'll eat dead and decaying organisms too as people who put out crab pots might find that your uh, bird carcasses attract um, sunflower stars too sometimes. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later too. So uh, they're a well-known, a beloved star. Another thing that's unique about them, as you can see, is that while many, I would say most sea stars have five arms, that's kind of like the magic number for the group that sea stars are in, uh, that symmetry around the number five. Uh, the sunflower stars have many more than that, 19, 21, 23, um, 24. So, um, so their number of arms can be variable um, and it's quite large. Uh, and um, it makes them, all these combined make them, uh, you know, um, quite, a, quite a sight to see in the wild. So the reason we got involved in this project and the reason that sunflower stars are endangered now is a mysterious syndrome that to this day, we still do not know what the cause is. In fact, um, there was a time when a paper came out purporting to know the cause. So maybe you think that we know the cause, and I did too for a time, but, uh, but it turns out that that was retracted by those authors. They said that um, 
further research suggests that that wasn't the cause. And actually, if you looked at the original paper, the data that they presented wasn't like a slam dunk. So we were all kind of like not totally sure. And then that just kind of like ended it. So now we're back to square one. We literally have no idea what this is. Um, but what we do know is that the disease was unprecedented in two major ways. Um, the disease struck every known species of sea star on the west coast, north of uh, the Northeast Pacific of, uh, you know, the west coast off North America, um, down from Alaska to Baja California. And we've never seen a disease like this. And as I'll get to, you know, if that doesn't shock you yet, I have a couple of slides that I'm, I'm hoping by the end of that, that that breadth of a single disease affecting that many different things is really truly shocking. So that's number one. The second thing is, as I alluded to, the geographic extent going all the way from Baja California to Alaska, thousands and thousands of kilometers of coastline. And uh, um, uh, from the intertidal down to deeper waters. So in, in every habitat we know of. So this was truly a calamity of you know, unprecedented proportions. And this slide here is actually from a paper that I'm a co-author on. Um, uh, we gathered some photos from a whole bunch of folks showing wasting this sea star wasting, which is what's this called. And, um, and in, the, um, uh, in the pictures, what you see are, they're sort of paired images. On the left are more or less normal looking stars, but what they actually are is ones that are expressing the mild early symptoms of sea star wasting. Some stars recover from that. They only show the mild symptoms, but when it gets bad, it gets really bad. And so you can see, for example, this, this uh, sea star right here, this is the same species that's dissolved into goo, which is basically what happens. Their arms fall apart. They get lesions all over their body and, um, uh, and they disappear into a pile of goo. These are sunflowers. This is a sunflower star right here. And, and, uh, um, it's, and so we saw this across species, but in sunflower stars, it was the worst of all. But um, before we go on, um, since I put this on the slide and uh, to make sure you're not asleep, we can, um, can we do this with uh, people either going into the chat window and answering or, you know, um, just offering an answer if they think they know by, um, by speaking out? Okay, either way is fine. If somebody would monitor the chat for me and speak up, um, Joan perhaps or, or someone, um, that would be great. Um, so here's the question. In the title, it says, this is wasting in five species of Pacific Northwest sea stars. Uh, so which is the East Coast species here? Wh or which is the one that's not from our region? Put it that way. Anybody have any ideas? The bottom right. The bottom right. That is not correct. Um, <laughs> that is... Uh, um, bottom left? On Bottom left is correct, mm -hmm. yes. That is a sea star from the Northeast, so very good. Um, I'll just go around and uh, um, this is um, this is Orthosterius coleri, Kohler's sea star. Um, not super common in the intertidal, the one that um, one person thought was, the, was not our local one. I think a lot of you knew immediately that this was one of our local stars. It's an iconic one, the um, Pisaster Acratius, the ochre star, which is named after its other color morph. This is the purple color morph. Um, these are bat stars. Interestingly, we don't have those in Washington, which is really weird because they're in Oregon, California and British Columbia. So you all might be quite familiar with this, but um, uh, Washingtonians may not be. Um, and, um, and here's a sunflower star. This is a sun star right here, Solaster. Um, and this is um, Asterius, a East Coast species. And the reason I wanted to put that up, not to you know, test your knowledge of sea stars, although that's always fun. I mean, the reason why I wanted to put that up is to show you that what's this East Coast species doing in here? I thought this disease was in the Pacific Northwest, right? Well, as it turns out, sea star wasting is not new. Sea star wasting has been seen in multiple different species in different regions, including our own, all over the world. Um, it seems like we don't know if it's always the same thing. Like I said, we don't know what the cause is, so we can't answer that question. But what we do know is that the symptoms can be quite similar. And, uh, um, and so, you know, with, this is an extreme version of something we already know of. Um, but I will say that, um, again, the, um, the difference, I just want to point out again, the difference here. Um, in this species, in, in this uh, example from the East Coast, um, this was a single species event in a relatively small geographic region. 
That's what we've always seen before, both of those things. This one is very different, like I said, because of the geographic extent of it and the extreme number of species that were affected. It's to some degree, maybe not very heavily, but to some degree, every species that we know of in the region, which is just totally shocking. And this is why I find it shocking, okay? So backing up a little bit of uh, taxonomy for you to remind you of the um, of what you might, might have once learned, sea stars are, you know, um, uh, we have a hierarchical organization of life because life has a single origin. So you can go back in time and find common ancestors. Um, the common ancestor of um, sea stars and its closest relatives all form this one group called the echinoderms. And the echinoderms are the spiny skinned animals. They're famous uh, sea urchins or famous um, sea cucumbers you see here. Um, uh, some of you probably know brittle stars at the lower right there and um, the crinoids maybe less so, um, feather stars and sea lilies although divers might have seen them around here. So, um, so those are, um, and, and again, as I have that little star in the background to remind us that that's kind of the theme of the echinoderms. And in addition to being a, um, spiny skinned, there are multiples of five. You can see it really clearly in this brittle star. But if you took a sea urchin's shell and you looked at it really carefully, um, if you found one on the beach, you would see that it's in, in multiples of five as well. And you'd see that for sea cucumbers too and sea lilies if you played very close attention to their bodies. So that's common feature. It's a weird thing about them. It's one of the reasons I love them. They have this really odd adult symmetry. So their metamorphosis is extreme in producing this very strange adult. And it's one of the reasons I got into studying them in the first place. But this is what I want to say. These are classes. That's the level below the phylum. So a kind of, a kind of derms, the spiny skin animals is a phylum. Um, so uh, the phylum that we are in is the, um, well, let's get to that. What is the phylum that we are in? Can somebody um, uh, can somebody answer that? I mean, we have common ancestor too. So, and and our, and our mammals. Phylum, sorry, mammals. Actually, that's the class. Cordata. 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 There you go. The chordates. The um, some people would say the vertebrates. I mean, that's a lower taxonomic group. Um, uh, but yes, the chordates, things that have a notochord, um, a spine or something like it. And so um, pretty much all of the, you know, fuzzy uh, charismatic animals, most of them that you can think of are members of the chordates. Um, so let's, um, uh, since, um, since um, I don't know who that was, somebody answered um, um, mammals. That was the correct question for what our class is. So I'll just go ahead and show you um, the chordates and our classes. So this is basically, there are, there are essentially five classes of, um, of chordates. I mean, it's a little more or less. I mean, depends on whether you're a lump or a splitter in some ways. Um, uh, the amphibians, um, frogs and salamanders, the reptiles, uh, lizards and snakes, dinosaurs. Um, well, birds, actually dinosaurs are birds, um, excuse me. Um, birds um, and fish are actually in the same um, uh, are also in, um, are, they're separate, I'm sorry, th this picture has a bird and a fish. Those are two separate um, classes there. And then um, this, this little guy down here to get back into marine invertebrates, this is a little thing, looks like a frog tadpole, right? This is actually the larval stage of a sea squirt, of um, something that some of you peachcombers would know. That doesn't look anything like a chordate, right? But as a tadpole, it does. So as a larva, you can see its features that are very similar to us, that it loses as an adult, and then it becomes a filter feeder that looks more like a sponge than, an, you know, superficially than a chordate. And then there's, um, then there's uh, mammals. So, um, uh, and um, yeah, that's some, um, I, I decided to switch that up, um, the, the example mammal there, just for the Canadian audience here. Um, so um, uh, what I wanted us to think about, and you know, I don't think we can spend too much time on really wrapping our heads around this concept. Like sea stars are cl a class at the same level as mammals. Think about a disease that could affect along the west coast of North America, every single type of mammal from bats to bird, to um, excuse me, bats to whales to horses, dogs and cats, mice. Uh, you can think of many I mean, bunnies. I mean, like uh, cows. 
Um, the list goes on and on. These are all mammals. Imagine a disease that affected all of those things. I mean, like literally we'd be running around. We wouldn't be sitting here talking on Zoom. We'd be running around with our heads cut off like crazy people being like, what are we gonna do? This is a disaster of epic proportions. And literally that's what happened in 2013 to the sea stars. So um, moving forward again. Um, so with sea star wasting disease, um, it turns out that it was um, uh, worse in some places. This is now data. These curves, just to sort of orient you, it's a little graph. If you look at these curves, it's, a bit, it's, it's about the um, mortality, the die-off. The, the farther it goes down and the steeper it was, the worse the die-off was in the region of the West Coast. And this is data from sunflower stars. Uh, and so what you can see is there's, even if you can't see the colors, they're pretty much ordered in the order that they appear on the left. Um, basically, uh, at the northern latitudes in Alaska, it wasn't so bad. Um, Southeast Alaska, a little worse. In kind of northern areas of British Columbia, a little bit, a little bit worse than that. In the Salish Sea, where we are, worse. And then it got really bad as you went down into the outer coast of Washington to Oregon. And then in California, we haven't seen a sunflower star in the wild for years. So they are predicted to be and in Baja California in, in Mexico. So they're predicted to be um, extinct or nearly extinct in the wild. So this is this, um, looking at this die off and the extent of it is the reason why the International Union for the Conservation of Nature declared um, sunflower stars to be the first ever endangered sea star species um, just this last year. So, um, so we got to work, we went on and collected, as you saw in the Sailor Sea, there were some stars. We collected a bunch. Like I said, we have 26. We figured out how to get them to reproduce. Here is, um, was a really exciting moment where, um, where one of our females um, finally did uh, release some eggs. And, um, uh, and what you can see here, if you look really carefully, they get up into this spawning posture when they're ready to spawn. Um, so they're like up on their haunches. And that's probably, to get above the boundary layer on the bottom into the bigger flow because they want their eggs to be carried off and be fertilized by males um, downstream. So, uh, so that's probably the reason for it. Otherwise their, their eggs will just fall on the seafloor below them and many of them might not get fertilized. Um, so they go, do you see these little tiny streams here? They look like little cream colored lines. I'm sort of following it with my, yeah, I mean, you know, Maybe I'm a crazy person who just sees these things and I see eggs where nobody else does. But this is them spawning. And what I wanna point out is that they've got gonads, actually a pair of them on each arm. So this sea star, which I think had 21 arms, spawned out of 42 of its gonads when it was ready to spawn. So they can release a lot of eggs and they release a lot. When they're spawning, they release millions um, of eggs each time they spawn. And these things can live for decades. So, so um, uh, you know, they have a very, very high level of reproduction. However, we are not, even before uh, sea star wasting, we were not overrun with sunflower stars or any other kind of sea star. So as you can imagine, this life, this life strategy is very different than us. We have one, maybe a, a few more than one offspring at a time, and we spend an extensive amount of time caring for that individual until they are ready to go off on their own. If you're a sea star baby, you are on your own from day one, except what mom packed in the egg for you. And, uh, and so you're off forming into a little embryo that's going to be out and never see your mom again, probably. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the, the losses are very, very high. They get flown away in the tides. They get eaten by other things in the plankton. Um, they don't find the right place to settle down. Um, they're in poor food conditions or some other conditions that are not good for the larvae. And then they make it down to the seafloor um, in the wrong place, in a place that you know, was good one year, but then a bunch of sediment comes down and, and um, the habitat shifts, or there's a big storm that comes in, or there's predators on the seafloor or diseases. I mean, countless different things can happen that bring that number from 1 billion million down to a predicted amount. If a population is stable, one of these females is gonna have, you know, Oh, and, and, it's, and its partner, the male, will have two uh, surviving offspring. And then the population will stay the same size. Um, and we know that these populations aren't dramatically changing most of the time, so that's about what it is. It's like literally one in a million chance um, of individuals surviving. So a little bit more, um, go through um, how we approach this uh, project. Um, 
we went out collecting. Uh, so, and, and by the way, those little sunflower stars that are in my hand in the first and the third image there, those are ones that were too small to collect. We actually kind of used our hand as the size. It needs to be significantly bigger than the diver's hand. But this one, um, the diver happened to bring up and uh, so took a picture before we released it. Some of our diver helpers in the second slide there. And, um, and here's, uh, not to be confused with the humped up, um, uh, position of that reproducing animal. This is not humped up um, uh, reproducing um, sea star here. This is one that whose stomach is completely full of food. So it's eaten a bunch of muscles and it just fills up. It's, uh, they have a flexible body, so it just fills up their body like that. So like I said, we had reproduction, they spawn. This is, um, this is actually a field of eggs. So each of those little dots is a single egg of a sunflower star coming out of that, um, of that sea star. And uh, those eggs actually are a little bit bigger than ours, 50% uh, say, larger than the size of human eggs. So they're pretty small. Um, and then this is sort of this first event that embryologists are always looking for. And it looks, and if I told you that this was a human egg, you probably would believe me. Um, it looks very much like this in humans. The first thing that happens is this, the egg divides in two. And then it starts dividing up into more and then differentiates in different parts of the um, uh, organism. And then a larva is formed. Uh, and the larva, as you can see, this is a picture of a sunflower star larva. And um, I don't know about you, but that doesn't look like a sunflower star to me. It looks nothing like a sunflower star, actually. And in fact, um, this, this, these stages are, again, in some ways more like us, more like the other um, related groups of organisms that are non-echinoderms than they are the special echinoderms with this five-fold um, body. These guys have bilateral symmetry, um, meaning that you could draw a line down the body and on the two sides, you're pretty much equal on each side. And these larvae are like that. They've got these pairs of arms. Here's one, here's a pair on the other side and these pairs of lobes here, another couple pairs of lobes and the body just sort of runs down this way. This is a bit of a contorted image, but there's the line of symmetry of that larva there. Um, so yeah, let's take a look at a video. How about that? I'm going to stop sharing for a second and then start sharing, uh, this beautiful image that, um, Dennis Wise from UW Media took of, um, of swimming su sunflower star larvae from our lab. So, so that's them. They're like, uh, these transparent, that's one of the reasons we love them. It's so easy to see their morphology. They're, they're totally see-through. The red parts is the food we give them. We give them a, a microalgae, um, a, red, a red colored microalgae, and it fills up their guts here. And, um, and that's their um, intestine coming out. And so, um, and mesmerizing, right? We could watch them all day. Let's go back to the presentation. Yeah. Okay. All right. So moving on. All right. So after they go through their whole larval stage, um, this is, you know, to me, this was, this was made the whole thing worth it. Seeing the process of transformation happen or the larva transforms into a little baby sea star. You know, metamorphosis is my thing. And so this is it happening right before your eyes. And the process in sunflower stars is unbelievable. So, so here's one of those larvae. They've got these super long arms that they wave around. Um, this thing, by the way, just to give you a sense of scale is about a millimeter or no, about a two millimeters long at this stage or something like that. Um, so this is a microscope view. This critter right here that it's sitting on is a coral and alga that some of you might be familiar with. It's a Caliarthron. It's, a, it's an articulated coral and algae. Um, it's a little bit washed out because of the light here. Normally it appears much more pink. Um, but I wanna point out this structure here. See that? We call it the helmet. And see the helmet over here on this guy? So they've landed down and they've stuck down with arms that are better at sticking to things than I have ever seen. You cannot get that sunflower star off of that, um, no matter what you do. Squirt a jet of extremely high intensity water at it, it won't budge. Um, you have to poke it off. Uh, and so, and it's funny because when you poke them on the side, they basically decide to let go, which is very fortuitous. Otherwise we wouldn't know how to move them around. 
But um, uh, what you can see happening here, here's the helmet. So what the helmet is, the helmet is, it's getting a head start on formation of the juvenile. It's already starting to form the spines and the body pattern of the little juvenile inside the larval body here as a little cap on its, this is actually its posterior end, on its rear end. And what it's happening here is it's sucking down all of those larval tissues down into the larva here. And you can see now there's just little nubbins, these orange little nubbins that used to be these super long arms. And it's gonna suck all that stuff down, reuse it, recycle it for growth as a juvenile. Um, and so it's gonna um, break down all those tissues and reform them. And here's that little um, cap again, the helmet. And then eventually it forms a little um, tiny little sea star that hears a bunch of them down on a little piece of a broken off coral and algae. Um, and so what you can see if you look really carefully here is you see the star, the five-fold symmetry right there. Um, so, and, and maybe you can see the pentagon here, which again is that sort of five-fold symmetry. So they start off their juvenile life in five. They end up with 21 arms, but they start with five. Of them. And so, and we knew that, but we were able to now see it happen for the first time. Well, we hadn't actually technically know that, we guessed that, but we were able to now see it, see them grow up from five um, to, uh, you know, now our, our two-year-olds getting ready to be two-year-olds have like 14 arms at this point. Um, so I'm gonna take a little detour here though, because we were just talking about metamorphosis, my favorite topic. So let's talk a little bit about metamorphosis and see what it is. And um, uh, I put up here slides of 10 different creatures that I think you know one could describe as having metamorphosis and, uh, or maybe not. And so, and I wanted to ask you all, what do you think about these different critters? Do they have a metamorphosis in their life or not? And maybe you don't know because you have no idea what their babies look like. Or maybe you don't know because you don't know what metamorphosis means. And you know, um, you would be right in both cases because there's a lot of disagreement about what the term means. But thinking about metamorphosis in the common way that you think about it, um, think about this first one here, this frog. Um, does it have metamorphosis? Yes. 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 Yeah. yes. Um, there's the tadpole. Um, and you can see that's a pretty dramatic difference. Uh, it's a di di big difference in habitat. That's like one of the key things that often is in metamorphosis. This is going from an aquatic to a ter terrestrial stage. It's going from a gill breathing to a lung breathing form. So, so it's, so it's, um, it's a, um, it's quite a dramatic shift. How about this, uh, how about this um, Orchinus orca here? No. 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 Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just show off my, um, my Photoshop skills here. So, um, so there's, um, uh, there's the, uh, the baby. And um, so yes, looks very much like the adult, just like all mammals, um, they start off looking a lot like us adults do. What about this earthworm here? No. Do you have worm bins? No. No, right. Yeah. Little babies look, you know, just little tiny worms. They, they, they don't really change in their morphology very much. So, I mean, you know, I should say there's disputes about this. Don't like quote me on this as if like go around saying like, you know, we have proven that worms don't have metamorphosis. There's probably some people out there who can make a compelling argument that some important things happen in between this stage and this stage that could justify being calling it a metamorphosis. So I'm talking about what my definition is and it seems to be matching yours, at least for now, um, uh, the ones who've answered. And that, like, that's not a dramatic change um, to the extent that something like this frog is. How about this worm here, this uh, polychaete worm? No. Yeah. So that's a that's a good good. Um. Uh. I I'm, I'm a I'm little gonna, bit. I'm I'm gonna say yes, even though I know why you said, like this larva. You can you can totally convince me that it doesn't do a lot of change. It's already got most of its segments and it looks segmented, it looks like a worm already, but this thing is swimming. And the, uh, the other one is on the seafloor. So it changes in its habitat, at least. There's a pretty major change in its life. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it enough to justify it as a, at least a mild metamorphosis, if not a super radical one. What about this cricket? Yes, yes. Okay, people say yes. Um, most scientists would say no. Baby crickets, the only, the, they do change, Wings, okay, wings is a big deal. Baby crickets don't have wings. And you can see they can jump super far. They have these great adaptations for jumping far even when they don't have wings, but wings are better. 
um, for being able to escape from uh, predators and find uh, mates and so forth. So, so that is a you know um, actually what the um, what the um, insect biologists call it is hemimetabolous insects, which is sort of like halfway metamorphosing insects. So they're you know I'll, I'll give it to you, and they're sort of in between. Um, so we can call them half metamorphosis. But what about this monarch butterfly down here at the lower left? Yeah. 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 Yeah, okay. I think we're gonna, I think we're all in agreement there. That thing, you know, most people wouldn't even know that they're looking at a monarch. Um, brilliantly colored, totally different colors. Um, but again, I do want to sort of, before we go overboard, um, you know, and I love insects, I'm not trying to diss insects here or anything like that. But if you think about it, and only do this in your mind's eye, because we would never do such a cruel thing. Think about pulling the, the wings off of that butterfly and what you would have left behind. You would have left behind something that looked very much like this. So the basic body of, a, of an insect doesn't change in its overall morphology. It still has the same anterior, posterior, head to tail axis. It still has the same segmental pattern that it keeps from the larva to the adult. It's pretty dramatic. It gets wings, it gets legs, it gets antennae, it can fly. I mean, it has all different kinds of behaviors. It can mate. Obviously it's very different, but in terms of its basic body form, you can still recognize it. Um, whereas, uh, you know, what I was telling you about the sea stars before, you know, I would argue that that's more radical. Um, so what about this one? What about the, the mushrooms? Yes. Yes. No. no, because it's not an adult. That's just like a, showing a picture of a blueberry. <laughs> That's very interesting. I mean, I, I don't think I, I don't think any of you are wrong. I happen to agree with the people who say yes, because I mean, technically it's a fruiting body. It's not a fruit, um, but you're right. I mean, in the sense that it is the reproductive form in that sense, it might be more akin to a plant producing its fruiting structures, which I don't think most people would consider metamorphosis. But the reason why I wanna call this a metamorphosis is this transformation, which is just remarkable. Um, the vegetative state, which lives underground in a different habitat um, than the adult, than the, than the reproducing form does, um, is very different. It's this mycelium, this network of, um, of uh, interconnected cells. And then it forms into this structure and emerges up out of the ground into these remarkable forms that we see um, in a, in I would say at least akin to a very metamorphic like transformation, put it that way. Um, what about fruit flies? Um, if you dig really carefully in your compost bin, you've probably seen the larvae. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, fruit fly larvae look like that, little maggots. Um, and, uh, and then the sea, the sea urchins, we've been talking about sea stars. What about sea urchins? Anybody here ever seen a sea urchin baby? What it looks like? This is gonna be better to describe the sort of bilateral symmetry. It's much more obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so here's, the, um, here's the sea urchin, okay? Bilateral, they've got these arms, these we don't call them spines, they're actually arms that they use for feeding. Although the calcium carbonate that's in there is the same calcium carbonate that they use to make their spines. But what's actually happening here, so down, if you draw a line down the middle, you can see that they have bilateral symmetry, kind of, right? This is a very late stage larva and it's breaking that bilateral symmetry. You see how this side is very different than this side over here? This left side over here is the stomach of the larva that's getting pushed to the side by the forming juvenile structures. This is the little baby juvenile forming almost like a little parasite inside the sea urchin larva um, and uh, being fed by the sea urchin larva. And at a certain point, there will be a catastrophic event of metamorphosis where it'll suck down the tissues just like I showed you for the sea star and out will come a little tiny baby sea urchin with spines and little tube feet um, to walk around. And um, so finally, in keeping with the uh, Canadian theme here, um, is Ryan Gosling a um, metamorphic organism? <laughs> no. No. Let's see what we got. Hold on, sorry. There we go. No, Ryan's, Ryan's kid looks a lot like Ryan. Um, okay. Moving along. 
All right, so, um, and I just wanna give a little pitch for an educational website that I have. If you wanna know more about metamorphosis and settlement and those larval forms, we have a larval qu matching quiz where you can try to match the larvae to the, to the juveniles and actually use a couple in this. So you'd, you'd have a head start on other people because you've probably seen, I think the, the, the worms might have been from that activity, but it's called Virtual Urchin is the website and the activity is called Surfing to Settlement. This website, Virtual Urchin is an educational tool for students ranging from, let's say high school to college. And, uh, and we have a bunch of activities on everything from microscopy to um, uh, settle, settlement, which is the settling down of the larvae during metamorphosis um, and uh, um, ocean acidification and various other things. So I encourage you to have a look. It's freely available. Questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm thinking of arthropods as mm -hmm. in decapods in the ocean and, and mm -hmm. following your habitat theory mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. of, of part of the rationale for metamorphosis, there are a number of um, juvenile arthropods whose larval form is quite different from the adult. And yes, they do swim many of those, or sorry, they do spend time up in the water column before settling out. So would you call those a metamorphic life cycle? I personally would, and I think most crustacean biologists would as well. Um, so you're absolutely right. In fact, some people argue that they have two metamorphic stages in their progression, where they go from a earlier larval form, which is much more sort of like common among different kinds of arthropods called a nauplius. And then, mm -hmm. and then like um, uh, decapods will then metamorphose into these little tiny, like if you look off a dock, sometimes you see these swarms of crab larvae. And those are often the crab larval form. They've taken on the appearance of a little crab. Mm -hmm. and uh, little tiny guys, but they swim as you noted. And then they settle down to the seafloor, which then is the second phase, I guess you would say, of metamorphosis in these. So, um, mm -hmm. so some people would say there's even more than one metamorphosis. There's even a more extreme example of an arthropod that has no doubt a metamorphosis. That would be a barnacle. They have, um, yes. they have that early stage larva that I described. Then they transition into a form that's completely unlike anything else called a cyprid. That thing then finds its way down to the seafloor and transforms its body into a really weird looking arthropod. Um, and uh, clearly a lot of remodeling there. Um, and it's literally stuck to that spot for the rest of its life. So it's making a really important decision about where to settle down there. Um, Very interesting. Yeah, Thanks. That's the metamorphosis too. I would say. Okay, so I'm just going to sort of go through some of the challenges we've had in our program. So we raised them, we got them to these juvenile stages, and we started experiencing issues. Um, this brown gunk that's in the upper left corner is a diatom that fouls all the tanks at Friday Harbor Labs, and it fouls all of our cages, and it turns out it was toxic to juveniles. So we've come up with very extreme protocols of getting rid of that, of cleaning our cages, of cleaning the water that's coming in. Um, staying on top of this. So it's been, you know, the couple of years of work we've been putting on this, we're constantly, you know, re-rigging the sails um, uh, as we go along, basically. And um, here's a nice little field of, of juveniles, like at this very small stage. But um, as cute as these look, um, um, there's other problems too, as I'll show you later, they eat each other. Um, if they're too crowded and they don't have the right kind of food. Um, it's a very sensitive stage of their life. So a lot of them die at this stage. So this is about half a millimeter in diameter, um, pretty small when they first settle down. And uh, um, when they get up to about double that size, as I'll show you in a, in a little bit, then their survival gets, to, gets going, but we're still struggling with how to optimize growth and um, getting them through that sort of gauntlet period that we call it right after they settle down as these little cute juveniles and getting up to about this stage when they're about a millimeter and um, uh, they're better at eating, say, or at least we know what to feed them a little bit better. And you can see these ones growing, adding arms as they grow. Um, and um, we feed them uh, baby shellfish. I think you see a couple in the background in this image, um, aquaculture grown, uh, recently settled clams and oysters um, turn out to be very good food for them. And this is one of our early attempts at trying to culture them 
when I was here in Seattle on main campus in little bins with flowing seawater through pumps going through the cages because they needed flow and uh, keeping them in clean seawater that we had to change. And we've been, like I said, changing this constantly as we go along. Um, nope, that was the other way, sorry. Here's the cannibalism I talked about. Um, so there's one of the little babies on top. And um, if it kind of looks like this one has too many feet, it's true. Those three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine feet are the, are the um, juvenile below it that it's cannibalizing. And so this has been described in other sea stars as well. We actually don't know how common it is in the wild, but what we do know is that they're very crowded in the lab. They can do that. And that of course makes a big challenge because you would like to crowd things. I mean, people who do aquaculture, they tend to grow a lot of things together, but they don't often grow predators. So this becomes a problem. We need more water per individual. And it just means more space, more care, more time, more food to feed them and so forth. And it's just, you know, increases the challenges that we've had to deal with. Um, so this though was very exciting when we saw this. So, you know, I showed you a picture of the purple urchin before. Didn't point out that it was a purple urchin. Um, so um, the, um, and, and before I get into this, I guess I should, um, you know, maybe I'll stop sharing for, sec for a second and, and give a little bit of, um, of, of a context of the ecology for a moment um, of this issue. Why do we care about um, these um, sunflower stars, uh, you know, per se? It, um, other than all the things I told you, I mean, obviously, I hope I've convinced you that they're amazing organisms, we should care about them. But really, I mean, ultimately, is the disappearance of sunflower stars really that big a deal for the ecology itself? And you know, other than we would love to preserve species, which I agree with too, and, um, and they're an important member of the ecosystem, which I agree with too, but exactly how important? It turns out quite important. Um, the uh, predators in ecosystems structure those ecosystems. This has been seen, for example, very famously, infamously in some cases in North America with wolves and wolf reintroduction. How quickly, when wolves come back into a habitat, how the entire ecosystem can get restored um, by predating on the herbivores that then restore the native um, vegetation, for example. I mean, this is, uh, this is something that we see over and over again in the ocean and on land. And so, and the same is true of sunflower stars. When they disappeared in California was exactly the same time that there was a catastrophic loss of kelp. And so the kelp forests in California just completely disappeared down from, you know, their original cover down to almost 10% of their former numbers. And uh, years before, another one of the predators um, of, um, on the, on the um, an important predator in that kelp forest ecosystem are sea otters. And sea otters had already been fished, also been fished out and have been fished out of most of the West Coast, although are present in some places, including in BC. Um, so so uh, uh, when, when you drill down and look at what exactly is going on to cause these kelp to disappear, what you see is a massive proliferation of the things that eat kelp which are sea urchins. Sea urchins, purple urchins, great species. I love them. Um, I love to study them and um, they're very charismatic, really interesting ecologically um, and in many ways. But their populations are out of control and their populations are out of control probably because their two main predators are gone now. Um, and so urchin populations went through the roof, um, kelp populations plummeted and you're having this massive phase shift of this incredibly important coastal ecosystem that you know is nursery ground protects from storms is food for all kinds of organisms including us and uh you know important um important nursery grounds for species that we um uh that we also um fish and um uh the biodiversity of the habitat i mean it's all goes back to the kelp and when the kelp is gone you have this massive phase shift to something much more depauperate than it was before. So this is the reason why uh, we are um, we are you know concerned um, even more so than we would be by any species that would were to disappear like they did catastrophically. So just to sort of now go back to where we were there, um, this was incredibly exciting. So we we raised little baby sea urchins because we do that. 
in our lab. And we tried to feed them to the baby sea stars. And, and by the way, let me point out, these baby sea stars, nobody had ever seen them before. They're way too small to find in the wild. These things are, like I said, you know, they're, the, they're poppy seed size. So, um, so, you know, you can't, a diver couldn't really see them. Um, and so uh, what they're doing, we have no idea. So this is the only way to get at those life stages, to raise them yourself, just like we did. And when we fed urchins to them, lo and behold, they went right on top of them the way they went on top of their own kind. And they started eating urchins. And actually, it's even kind of better news than that. So here's some more data for you. This is very recent data that we analyzed. Um, uh, sorry, please ignore that urchin down here at the bottom. I don't know what that got from there. Um, so what this graph is showing you is our data on feeding a bunch of sea urchins to these, to these um, sunflower star juveniles as they grow. Pycno is short for Pycnopodia, the sunflower star. Um, so, and this is the number of urchin juveniles consume, consumed per day. And so what you can see is at these little sizes, remember I said 0.5 to one millimeters, that critical size, they will eat them, but not very many. But once they get above one millimeter, wow, do they start eating them. And when they get up to five millimeters, they're eating five or six um, baby sea urchins a day, you know, and an adult sunflower star will maybe eat one or one and a half if you're really lucky. They, they do strike fear into urchins, but they're not going around like eating 10 urchins at a time. So this idea that if sunflower stars immediately came back as adults um, on, um, in, in the kelp forest, that they would immediately you know, get rid of the urchins is probably not realistic. But if you consider the whole life from that tiny little stage all the way up to big ones, if all throughout there they're feeding on urchins and if they're feeding on urchins at this kind of rate at these lower, at these smaller sizes, you could make a dent in the populations. Um, by if the, uh, if the um, uh, sunflower stars were restored. So we're very excited by these data because we think that it um, indicates an unknown ecological function of these unknown life stages of sunflower stars that we only were able to study because we raised them. And the only reason we raised them was because we got funds to raise them because, uh, because the Nature Conservancy realized the ecological problem and wanted to fund our work. But let's think about this for a second. You know. Um, this is important basic scientific ecological information that we did not know. And it took us now two years into this project for us to find out. We should know this stuff already. And the way you know this stuff already is if you get people you know, like me and all the other thousands of scientists that are out there that are gung-ho to do all this work, get them doing the work that they want to do. Um, properly funding science um, will lead us to these discoveries that will 100% will have important implications later. And we won't have to go through this sort of triage method of finding out what we should already know. So here's another image. Um, this is before we started doing size separation. This is an old picture. Um, this big one right there is in danger of eating all those because eating all the urchins already. You can see the um, urchins and the, um, the shells that are remaining, but now it's probably going to go on and feed on its uh, its own kind, the little ones that are not growing as well as it does. So now we spend a lot of time size separating them. So we never keep sunflower stars of this size in the same cage as ones of this size, um, so that we can try to keep them all alive. Um, and uh, here's some more pictures of some of our you know growing situation. Now you can see that coralline algae that maybe looks more like what those of you who are familiar with see. We have these pumps driving flow through, these are actually air splitters, but we use them as water splitters. And then we have flow going into each of the cages and out these little mesh windows. They have to have constantly flowing clean seawater, very important for their survival. And so that's the conditions that we grow them in. And you know, it takes a lot of work, but it's worth it. Um, here's a couple more of our sort of like, you know, these I guess were about six month old when Dennis took this picture sitting on one of their mesh screens here. Um, similar to some of the ones you saw earlier. And these are getting on, on a year, about this size, going for a little baby manila clam. And, um, and, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. This is, not, this is what they were about six months ago. Um, and you can see they've got more arms and they're growing. Uh, they got stripes on their arms now and they're starting to get a little bit of coloration. And um, uh, got a couple other quick videos to show you here. Um, show you this. Um, let's see. This was kind of cool to see. So, oh, so this is an adult, okay? Um, 
This is an adult doing what we call it's begging behavior. The, um, the top is open on the tank. It sees the light. It sees us standing around. It starts showing us its stomach. It wants muscles and we drop the muscles right in there. So they have total mind control of us. And, um, and so they do this begging behavior. They've, it, it's been a learned response that we've seen that they've picked up while they've been in captivity. Um, let me try sharing the, um, this one now. Jason, there was a question. Yeah. Uh, how do you separate the tiny sea stars from the slightly larger ones? Um, by hand. Oh, yeah. there you go. We just go in, we put, so those little cages that I showed you back in the beginning, um, those little square cages, which actually are little food service containers um, that we cut the holes in for the, um, for the mesh windows, we sized, we, we picked those specifically because you can take one of those things and stick it under a microscope. And we spent a lot of time looking at them under the microscope, picking them up, moving them from cage to cage. We have to move everything out of a cage when we clean the cage. And when we do a cage cleaning, if we see a size disparity, we'll take the larger ones and we'll move them to their size match cage. So, and when I say we, this is my lab assistants now. I luckily have two lab assistants helping me with this um, project and they are working all the time on this, um, doing those kind of things. Um, okay. here's, here's that same begging um, behavior now in our juvenile. <laughs> These are now like one and a half year old juveniles doing that same thing where they're going up to the surface and begging. So we're, one of the cool things was seeing these um, emergence of behaviors. And another thing you see, you see how they're all kind of hanging out with each other here? The adults do that too, that gregarious behavior. Um, so clearly they've gone from killing each other, eating each other to a time when they're just like best buddies. And that emerges sometime in about the one centimeter size range where they seem to become gregarious. And so, I don't know, maybe you call that the transition from like your teenagers who hate each other to when they, you know, get to college and they become friends again or something like that. So that's probably what's, you know, um, you know, emerging of adult behaviors. Um, and so we're seeing that too, which has been really exciting. It's just been a fun part of the project. Um, and, uh, I don't have much more here, but I just want to just complete the presentation so I can, you know, give my acknowledgments here. Yeah, there was another question. Uh, what is the size at one year? Ah, so um, one year is um, about, let's say, what was it, six centimeters. And now where they are kind of like just about to get to their two year, and I'm counting, by the way, from fertilization. Um, I'm not arguing that life begins at fertilization, by the way. I'm just counting from fertilization. Um, so uh, so the, the ones that we have now are, are more than 15 centimeters. They're about that big now. So, you know, they're growing pretty fast. Um, so yeah, maybe about five centimeters to 15 is what they've grown. So about 10 centimeters a year, and they get up to about 60 centimeters um, as, you know, the largest ones we know of at all. Um, so, you know, they might, they might be able to get up to full size in just a few years. And we think that the ones that we have that are two year old right now are probably going to be reproductive this year. Um, so we think they can be reproductive in two years. So, um, but we also know based on the fact that some aquariums, for example, have kept sunflower stars in their care for decades, um, that like a lot of other echinoderms, they can live very, very, very long times. If, if you told me that you knew of a sunflower star that had been kept for over a hundred years, I would not be surprised. We don't know that, but I wouldn't be surprised by that at all. That would, um, some of the largest ones that we have out there could be cent cent centenarians. And there's another question for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you still growing and studying them or have you released some of them into the wild? Ah, um, great question. I'm gonna, let, let me put that off for just a second and go through these other slides because I have a conclusion slide where I was gonna talk about release into the wild. Okay. Um, so this is when we realized that our cages were getting too small for our sunflower stars. You can see that three of them here are filling up the entire cage and the, the food behind them is littered with mussels and clams and oysters down here that they've been eating um, and they're ravenous. They eat, um, you know, they went through a cup, they went through 10,000 or 15, um, one and a half year olds were going through like um, 10,000 clams in a two months or something like that. I mean, it's, it's outrageous the amount that they eat. Um, so we got them a new home. And so this was when we took the cages, we dropped it into their new home and you can see them exploring their new cage here. It's a glass tank now, more space for them to move around. Um, that white grating right here, just to tell you a little anecdote, 
We put that because we had different cages of sea stars that didn't know each other, and we wanted to get them to introduce them to each other before, you know, you know, at this, we didn't want to stress them out with like new stars at the same time as they were also getting a new tank. So we introduced them on either side of the barrier. And within about six hours, they had come up and they were like on either side of the barrier, putting their two feet through the barrier, like touching each other. So they were like, they were already learning, you know, who, the, who their new tank mates were going to be. And when we remove the barrier, they are just like the adults are, where they're just gregarious with one another and big big hog pile for most of the day. All right. So, um, so what's next for the project? And this gets into that issue of, um, can our uh, lab race stars survive in the wild? Um, I should probably plug in my computer here in a moment. Um, so um, uh, we want to find that out. So we are planning captive rearing. At Friday Harbor Labs, we just need the permission of our director to do this experiment. And that's because the local waters are actually under the regulatory control of the director of Friday Harbor Labs by Washington state statute. Totally unusual relationship. If we were doing work anywhere else, we'd have to get mega approvals from every government agency, you know, and, you know, while we understand that process, we also, you know, trust our director to make good ecological decisions because she's an ecologist. And, um, and so, uh, so we've been in those conversations, thinking about that very thing. This coming spring, doing an introduction with our, at that point, one-year-olds, which will be about 50 of them, we're thinking, and putting them into cages in the wild and seeing how they do. We can't just release them because we don't know what's going to happen. They'll just run away. And did they die? Did they survive? We'll never know. So we need to do these tests in cages at first to see if just putting them in the wild and giving them food, can they grow and thrive? And can they go and thrive as well as ones that we find in the wild were about the same size of about that same 15 or like, you know, six centimeter size class, which we expect our um, uh, juveniles to be coming this spring. And, um, uh, but we do want to be able to try to raise enough for larger scale reintroductions if these initial ones work and those will require regulatory approval. And it's going to require a lot of help from a lot of other people. Our lab is not equipped to be able to raise hundreds of thousands of sunflower stars. Our hands are full with, you know, um, uh, you know, a few dozens to hundreds of the of the juveniles to deal with, um, and um, and and there's so many more questions we can address by raising them, as I talked about earlier. Like this is giving us entree into really important basic biological questions with ecological import. Um, so how can we all help with this? We can help protect our um, you know beloved Salish Sea ecosystem in all the ways that I know all of you are already doing and thinking about through um, protecting our local waterways because everything eventually flows into the ocean, beach cleanups, um, uh, you know, being on top of any kind of beach developments that are happening, maybe a, um, who knows, a uh, pipeline going across the mountains of Canada to the West Coast, for example. Some of these things might be, um, might end up having negative impacts on our Salish Sea ecosystem and, and we might wanna be concerned about those issues. Um, uh, you can report sightings. If you see sunflower stars in the wild, take a photo, go to seastarwasting.org and log the information. We'd love, I mean, the people who are studying this, the population biologists and ecologists. And if you want to send me a photo, I love getting them. So please do. Uh, and um, uh, you can, um, uh, I mentioned they get into crab pots. It'd be great if crab fishermen knew that this was an endangered species that's not going to hurt them. So please gently release it back into the wild um, if you see it in the crab pot. Um, and we have a uh, we have an online campaign through the University of Washington, and um, it's uh, you know it funds our work. And so, if you're interested in donating, it goes right into our lab efforts, into paying for our staff and our facilities and so forth. Um, and it's called Stars for the Sea, and the website is tinyurl.com/stars-for-the-sea. And uh, so that's another option for you there. And just to finally finish up before my, um, I run off to get my uh, um, charger so that I don't die here um, uh, in my power. Uh, the, um, there were so many stars of this project from the divers to the people who helped us with space to during, especially during the height of COVID and lockdowns and people being generous with our access to places, um, places we've gotten shellfish from, people who've um, given advice about uh, the culturing methods that we're using, um, all kinds of people who've, you know, volunteered in this way or that. Um, 
uh, to help out with things and uh, our great um, maintenance staff at Friday Harbor Labs. Walter Hetty, my main contact in the Nature Conservancy of California are the main funders of this work. We also have gotten some funds from Sea Grant and I of course wanna thank all the people who've donated to the Stars for the Sea campaign already because we're you know using that money for our project. So um, that's pretty much it. 